you look on the program, you'll see um, both Lawrence and John, they have sort of a title of a talk that they're going to talk about, but I didn't have a title. So Joe told me I could talk about anything I want. So I told him I'm going to talk about my children. And he said, you should have something better. So can I get help putting up my presentation? It's next slide, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about, there, a book that we're writing about Canada's future. And it's rooted in one thing, protectionism. And the thing that we're going to argue in this, so this book is at U of T Press and we're doing revisions because we got some comments. Uh, but really it looks at Canada's trade policy and how Canada's trade policy continues to be backward looking. And as the world changes, Canada's future is at risk. And we need, and I'm going to argue, bold leadership in order to really shake things up in order for Canada to go to the right place. Now, someone asked a question earlier, and I'm just going to be blunt. Someone asked a question earlier about superclusters. My answer is going to be very clear. It's very easy for a government to take $950 million to throw out a problem. It's a lot harder to think about what the roots of the problem are that they're trying to fix. And that's very important because in the environment where we have innovation problems, throwing $950 million to try to get companies to be more innovative, if they're still operating in that environment that has these structural obstacles to being innovative, it's not going to help. And so I believe we need bold leadership in order to really move Canada to where we want it to be. Okay, so, um, did I go the right way? Oh, I lost the slide, but there you go, okay? So Canada, the first thing I do, so I teach in the MBA program here at Rotman. I've taught here for 20 years. Every class, the first question I ask the students, who in this room would ever want to live in a country other than Canada? And anybody who puts their hands up, I ask them to leave, no, okay? Really, we talk about it and people come to Canada because we're lucky. We have so many things going for us. We're lucky to be here. And when you look at it, we're the 17th largest economy in the world. We're two, a two trillion dollar economy. Income per person, 56,000 on average. The 2008 crisis, uh, yesterday, Jean today spoke eloquently about the financial crisis, how it really impacted people in the US. People were hurting and politicians weren't listening. In Canada, the crisis was half as deep and recovered twice as fast. A lot of that's driven by the people at the Bank of Canada, especially the Dean, Tiff Macklem, he did it, okay? But we're top 10 for math and science on PISA in 2016. Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and Vancouver are the top 25 cities in the world to live in, according to Mercer. An open and tolerant society, we have low crime rates. Oh my God, what a great country. And so we had these round tables and asked people, you know, should Canadians worry about the future? And in our initial discussions, the consensus was no, not really, look around. We've got everything everyone in the world wants. And our response, if you, th if you feel that way, I say you're complacent. And I love this quote from Deloitte that says, complacency is not an option, it's a danger. And I'll speak more to that. I tried to make this slide more dramatic, but my Excel skills aren't so great. But, and I'm happy Jean Chaudet is not here for the first one. But in 1967, you look at Montreal. It was Canada's major city. 50 years later, it's not. Toronto is. A lot can change in 50 years, especially when people are not aware of the underlying risks and trends and risks to the economy. China was completely isolated. The poverty in China, closed to the world. 50 years later, it's one of the world's leading economy on PPP. It is the world's largest economy. Berlin was a divided city. For those of you, most of you have been in Berlin, uh, before the, the fall of the wall. It's now a unified city. And if you go to East Germany, wow, it's cool. It's incredible what's happened. Lithuania under communist rule. And we have um, in our book, a story about Inga. 
Inga grew up under communist rule, where any aspiration to pursue your passion, to be innovative, was crushed by the communist government. Today, 50 years later, Inga and her family have a wonderful business where they sell slippers globally. And the last one is around all of the fourth industrial revolution, machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's really remarkable how much can change in, in 50 years. And my argument, or our argument in the book, is Canada is facing some significant headwinds. And there isn't the sense of complacency that we need. And not even Donald Trump has shaken up the Canadian government to do the right thing. That's our argument. Okay? So two important sources of Canadian prosperity going forward. You think of geography. Everybody knows the United States is always going to be our number one trading partner. It's always going to be our best friend. No one is arguing against that. But access to the U.S. market is increasingly coming under risk. 75% of our trade goes there. Um, you look at oil, the future of oil is that question. I couldn't agree more with uh, Martha Hall Finley. Canadians should have a discussion. Do we want to exploit oil or not? And I think the right answer is we should. We make the decision and we need to build those pipelines. And John Sade said it perfectly about the Wall Street Journal. We need to get these deals done. There's no urgency. There's no urgency at all. So what ends up happening is we have all of that oil in the ground. And in my opinion, and I'm going to say, it's, I think you said it, it's insane that we're selling that oil into the U.S. below world. It doesn't make any sense. We need bold leadership. Okay? So some predict the next generation will be the first generation. Jean Chaudet said it yesterday. The only way we can afford the livelihoods that we have is by having access into the global economy. And if you look at it, the number one market we look at is coming under increasing strain. We need to be in more global markets. So I know everyone in this room has seen this. I like to bring it up because, you know, the G7 countries, I put a bonus question on my exam asking how many countries in the G7? And two, two students said nine, okay? But when you look at the real question was order them for largest to smallest. But the G7, you look as a share of the global economy, it's gone from 60 to 30%, the BRIC markets, but it's really China, where China as a share of the global economy is really moving. And all of the data on this are incredibly clear. Canada's access into the emerging markets lags all other G7 countries. We're fixated on the US economy. Look at Canada. Uh, Actually, usually I see it's stable, but it's actually falling. And I think this is important for this slide. Who, I don't know if I'm in mixed company here, but who's the father of the G20? Who pushed that? Paul Martin. And the reason he pushed, the, he, the reason he pushed it, the reason he pushed it is Canada was put into the G7 on the insistence of the Americans to counter all the Europeans. So Canada was in the G7, but when you look at the previous picture, you see Canada's going to fall out of the G7. It's out of the G7. He pushed to G20 so that Canada could be at the table. But when you look on the left here, that's Canada's falling GDP rank. So we eliminate all countries that have a population of less than 5 or 10 million, I don't remember. But nevertheless, um, you look at Canada's falling GDP rank in 1967, we were the ninth largest economy in the world. Last year, we're 17th. In 2067, we're estimated to be 25, no longer in the G20. Um, you look at GDP per capita, which perhaps is more important. In 1967, we were third. Last year, we were 15th. And in 2067, given what I would say are conservative estimates, we're right there at 22. Canada is falling further and further and further behind, okay? So, um, we interviewed over 100 business leaders across the country. These are just three quotes I'm gonna use. Um, and uh, we didn't actually in interview Jim Balsilli, we just took this out of the globe. But these are three quotes that summarize the points we're trying to make. The first one, it's not as if we're, so this is John McCallum who we interviewed. It's not as if we're languishing and doing terribly 
but we're doing a lot better if we're more innovative in, uh, going forward. If we can somehow make our country more entrepreneurial, innovative, well, that would be well, that would do well for the future. The second one from Jim Balsilli. What we, should be, what we should fear is a stubborn reliance on 19th and 20th century policy strategies that have nothing to do with wealth generation in the 21st century economy. That nails it. And the third one, Canada's future prosperity is at risk. There is an urgent need for our country to move beyond extracting natural resources and capitalize on the opportunities presented in the knowledge economy. And a lot of people just look at the size of the natural resource sector and say, well, it's not that big, but Martha hit the nail on the head when she said, a lot of finance and other services all related to that underlying natural resource-based economy. Okay, so I love this quote from one of the people we interviewed. Prosperity hides the needs to change. Okay, so we've got all of these trends going against us and everybody looks around and thinks we're happy. Look at this slide and this, this is the red line here. That's Canada, but this is gonna be R&D spending relative to GDP. And you can see Canada kind of jumped up, but around 2000, something happened. And the best quote I've heard to explain that is the Canadian economy took their foot off the gas pedal. And Canada's innovation, R&D, has been fall it's going in the wrong direction at exactly a time when we need more innovation. Okay, so we have a big model, and I wish I had three hours, but I don't. I'm just gonna focus on the last two pillars. But this is our framework to help explain what needs to happen, in our opinion, in order for Canada to maintain itself as the great country that it is. I'm gonna focus in on access to markets and capital. So that was the fourth of the fifth pillar. We need to sign more free trade agreements. We need to prepare companies to access those agreements. So myself and Dan Treffler worked on the the analysis that Stephen Harper tabled to Sarkozy that looked at the benefits of the CETA. We worked on that. On that. We believe in the, the CETA agreement, Canada's trade agreement with Europe. I was there at the Royal York downtown with 5,000 other people when Stephen Harper said, we've now opened Europe to Canadian business. Now it's your turn to take advantage of it. And what does the article in the Globe and Mail say today? What's the title? There's an article in the Globe today that says one year after ratification, Canadian companies still have not taken advantage of it. And the reason they haven't goes to one thing. It all relates to innovation, which is what I want to focus on for a few minutes. But you think about protectionism permeates Canadian government policy. It is everywhere. And in my opinion, unless the Canadian government addresses protectionism, all of these other things will hit up against the protectionism and it will inhibit innovation in the Canadian economy. You think about all of the great people that come to Canada, come to the MBA class, come to the executive MBA class. You should see the people that we get from around the world, from China, from India, from Brazil, from the Middle East. They're unbelievably connected and articulate and they go to get a job and what's the first thing they're told? They don't have RCA. What's RCA? Relevant Canadian experience. Well, no wonder if you got a bunch of companies that are protected from foreign competition, where they can think about the Canadian and the American market only, they don't care about India and China and Brazil, then no wonder they don't need somebody that understands those markets. Whereas if we had leadership that really forced these companies to compete, and therefore think about going international. So a lot of our companies are not international because they stay into the Canadian market and they're focused, to, they're focused on these markets because of, of protection. Supply management. The best quote I heard about this, what kind of a policy does the government implement when it results in pitting one Canadian against another? All of these poor Canadians that have to buy dairy products and have to pay a premium so that relatively wealthy farmers can get a stable income. That's not the right policy. The idea is to create an environment that forces farmers to be globally competitive so they can participate in the global dairy market, not protect them so they only think about the Canadian market. 
and connectivity, or well, the de minimis limits, what can I say? We're among the lowest in the developed world for de minimis limits. It doesn't make any sense. Protectionism permeates Canadian policy. The last one is around connectivity. And Brookings just did a study with the Martin Prosperity Institute that they presented here at Rotman and talked about the importance of connectivity. And Canada lags most developed countries in terms of, for example, direct flights. Nobody should force any Canadian incumbent to do a, a direct flight when there isn't a demand. So if there's demand between two cities for a direct flight, if the incumbents in Canada won't do it, a foreign carrier should be allowed. But currently what happens is because of protectionism, Canadians are forced to fly through Europe or connecting cities, inhibiting connectivity and productivity. It's all around this protectionist mindset that really has to be uh, taken out of the Canadian vocabulary. That's a thing of the past. We don't need it. Okay? So um, this other dimension of our analysis is called a frictionless ecosystem. There's a Rotman graduate. I'm happy to report he's a billionaire, which is great. So he's my buddy. He has a company that exports to 60 countries. And we interviewed him. And I asked him, what are the obstacles? But more importantly, I asked him, how were you able to be so successful in an environment that maybe doesn't help you? And this was his quote. His quote was, when I deal with the federal government and try to get the permits and all of the approvals I need to do business, he said, it's as if they don't care. It's as if they're not on my side. And he said, here I am as a company that's really trying to create jobs and prosperity for Canadians, but they're not on my side. And that's why I thought what Jean Chaudet said yesterday about, I guess it was France and the concierge service, where if you want to do business in the global economy, government officials go into it with a yes mindset. That's not the case in Canada. And I think it was John that said it about the number of people that are really, are really focused on being involved in trade. You talk about the regulatory burden. 130, in fact, I made a mistake when I told my students to look it up. I said 13,000. It was 130,000, but Canada's regulatory system is smothering business in Canada thanks to a growing mix of complex, costly, uh, and overlapping rules from all levels of government. This is not a frictionless ecosystem. This is really what inhibits, inhibits business. So um, when you look at fintech adoption rates, for example, we talk about all the money going into fintech and innovation. This is from Ernst & Young on the left. Whenever I show this to people in the financial industry, they don't like it. But when you look at it, what does it say? It says that fintech adoption rates in Canada are the third lowest of all countries listed. Fintech adoption rates, Canada needs to be more innovative in adopting these two new technologies. Now, in our book, we have a chapter on the banking industry, and we believe the banking industry must remain protected. And the reason we say that is the grand bargain. The idea being that in exchange for protection, what did the banks give us? They gave us stability. But when I go outside that sector, I have difficulty justifying protection. On the right, this here is the World Economic Forum. And the number one obstacle to doing business in Canada is government bureaucracy. I can't read the first word. Inefficient. Inefficient government bureaucracy. So this is the last slide I have. But this is, in my opinion, the point. I'm doing a project right now with Global Affairs Canada. We have data on every company in the country, every company that's ever filed a tax return from 2000 to 2014. And we look at these companies that are doing business in the global economy. And the results are really, they're unbelievably strong to show that companies that are doing global activity are much more productive and much more innovative. In order to get Canadian companies to be successful outside of the US, they have to be more innovative. If they're not more innovative, they'll never succeed. 
And how do you make them more innovative? Is you have to expose the Canadian economy to more competition, so there's more R&D and more innovation and more commercialization. Thank you.